on the program here today. Guys, this is probably one of the best gifts you're ever going to find, you're ever going to have on this program. This is probably one of the best ride along you will ever have. This is probably one of the most inspirational show you could watch. So just mute everything else that is distracting you right now and pay attention to your phone. Put it on charge and pay attention to your phone. And if there is someone out there right now that you know that is depressed, someone that you know that need a quick pick me up, Someone that you know that need an inspiration right this minute, I want you to invite them right now. No joke. If there is anyone else out there that you think that is going through something that need to hear something inspirational, I want you to invite them right now. It is that important. It is that important. This is the best gift that you're going to have. So, without further ado, let me welcome on the ride, Mr. Alvin Law. Alvin, my brother, how you doing, sir? Back at you, my brother. Good to see you. I love that hair, man. I love that hair. <laughs> Alvin Law, Alvin, Alvin. Guys, I want all your... Uh, listen, I want everybody to press love for Alvin Law. Uh, just just that the site, just, just the guy himself. He's an amazing guy. You're going to find out more about him in the program. Everybody, I want everybody to press love for Mr. Alvin Law. Welcome him to the ride. Welcome him to the ride. Welcome him to the ride. Alvin, thanks again, sir, for accepting our invitation to come and chat with us here, my brother. Uh, my pleasure. My we, pleasure. We, we really appreciate it. And for you just taking the time out, you know, after we was going back and forth trying to figure out, would Monday work? No. Would Tuesday work? No. Would Wednesday work? Whatever day that was conducive to you, I would have changed around my... Even if you said Sunday, I would have possibly just do it on Sunday. Whatever day was, was best, best for you, I would have, I would have make, make it available to come on the program. Uh, all right. So, so thanks. Thanks, Alvin. I, I just waiting on more people to come into the ride because I think everybody should be... Should, should have to see this program. Sonia McKee John is saying hi to you. Um, Deanne is saying hi. We have the folks in the chat room saying hi to you. And they're ready for a great show. So let's start from the beginning, Mr. Law. Um, at first sight, we're looking at you. It it looks as if you have your hands tied behind your back. Nothing up my sleeves. Nothing up your sleeves. So, Alvin, tell us the story. You were born without arms. Tell, tell us the story. Betting uh, that a lot of your viewers and listeners would be familiar with a morning sickness medication that was very prominent in the late 1950s and early 1960s that was called thalidomide. Uh -huh. It's a big word, thalidomide. And, you know, if you want to Google it, that's fine. Uh, but thalidomide uh, was really the first ever safe sleeping pill. And we were talking about an era in the late 50s and early 60s when, in this case, women thought they could take medication when pregnant and there would be no side effects to their babies. Well, in 2018, we know the truth. But in 1960, when I was born, my mother did not. Uh, she simply went to the doctor. She wasn't feeling well. The doctor gave her a sample of this brand new medication. Uh, it didn't really work all that well, ironically. So she only took a couple of these pills, but that's all it took because this was about the, the first trimester of her pregnancy. And uh, quite literally, during that phase, my arms simply did not grow. Although the rest of me seems to be fine, uh, except for the lack of hair on my head. But that had nothing to do with the drug, just old age and, you know, fast <laughs> lifestyle, I guess. <laughs> no, the fact is, my, my life has been uh, an amazing miracle in many ways, and I never, ever try to underestimate the power of that word. But the miracle of my life is not about the fact that I turned out okay, even though I have no arms. Very quickly, uh, just to give you the whole story at the beginning, five days into my life, I was also homeless. Now, my birth family were not homeless people. They did not die, but I was sent to live in uh, foster care because my birth family just didn't feel they could take care of me. I was supposed to go and get adopted by another family, but in the end, the foster parents that took me in, and uh, that's really the story we're going to hear a lot about today, uh -huh. kept me. And at 58 years old, there's really, frankly, nothing I can't do. In fact, brother, we were joking that if I was with you right now, I'd be driving the ride along because I can even drive a car with my foot. So I learned to do everything with my feet. They're literally my hands. But as you can tell, and i got to tell you right off the start, you know, I, I love this already, and I've only been on the air for a couple of minutes with you, 
But I can tell you one of the baseline sayings in our home involved love. Yes. We were, we were a family of love. There was no question about it. My mom in particular made sure I was loved because, you know, a lot of people didn't treat me like that. So the more that I got love, the more my life became abundant, and I still believe that to this day. Yeah, so how was growing up, Alvin? Um, growing up with no arms, you look different than everybody else. How yeah. did everybody else treat you? Well, the key to all of this is I almost had a double life. And I mean that in the sense that I grew up in a very small community in rural Canada. And I want to get a, a shout out here to Yorkton, Saskatchewan, a little town in the middle of nowhere of Prairie, Canada. That was huge in my life. And other than a few jerks here and there, and there's jerks everywhere, uh, most of the community embraced me. The double side of my life was when I would leave my little town and I would go out into the bigger world. And a lot of that was to do with visits to hospitals. Uh, I, used I used extensively artificial limbs, although I didn't use them that much. I was more of, an, of, a, of a kind of a guinea pig. But I, I would go to hospitals in places that are, you know, people even in where you are would know, Montreal, Toronto, you know, other cities in Canada that were large. It was then that I started to notice the real negative reaction because, quite frankly, I rarely had that in my little town. It was that everybody knew who that little boy without arms was. But even more importantly, everybody knew my mom and dad because they were very, very active members of the community, but they weren't wealthy. They were blue collar. Uh, my dad was a mechanic. My mom was a homemaker, but they had such a reputation in town for being these caring, loving people that everybody loved my parents. So therefore, everybody loved Alvin. Yeah. So, so what about the, the things that you need your arms for growing up, like eating food or picking up the spoon or all that other stuff, giving high fives and the kiddie stuff. How did you get around that? So here's what's interesting is when my mom started noticing, this is one of my mom's first stories. Uh, the, you know, we were in the press, even, even at, at the beginning of my life, I've been, I've been involved in media like today uh, and not because I have an ego and I need to get media. Mom believed even in 1960-61 that this story needed to be told properly because all of the other stories about the thalidomide babies was the expression they used. Uh, you know, nobody was looking at the positive side, and one could argue, well, where could there be anything possible positive about this? That's the point. My mom saw the positive. So while she was very, very aware that I was going to have a lot of challenges without hands, one day she literally walked into my bedroom. I was laying in my crib. I was just a little baby, and I was playing with my favorite teddy bear, holding its left foot with my toe and second toe on my right foot. So I was playing with this little bear, hanging it upside down, swinging it around, and Mom kind of went, huh. That's interesting. So then she took me out of my crib, she put me on the floor, she put a bunch of toys in front of me, and before you knew it, I was playing with my toys. So mom kind of went, geez, I guess these are going to be his hands. But let's remember, this was 1961 or 62, uh, there wasn't Google, you know, we couldn't go, Siri, what do we do? So, you know, mom kind of went with her instincts and kind of just believed and had a lot of faith and said, you know what, we'll teach him to use his toes for feet. But the rest of it was really about three places, and that was the heart the soul, and the mind. Wow. So those things are the three elements that I believe were the integral part of my life changing into one that is so so abundant today, I can't believe it. Wow. So, so did, did, they have to, did you have to go to a, a class to learn how to use your feet as hands, or it was something that you just picked up over time? It was a natural instinct for me, and if, I, if people don't believe me, anyone in the audience who's ever had a baby would know that their babies play with their toes, suck on their toes, put their feet in their mouth when they're little, and we kind of take their feet and take it out and go, don't do that. <laughs> well, I didn't have a choice, so when I was kind of putting my foot in my mouth, my mom would stick a cookie between my toes, and I would eat like that. You know the irony of your question? Uh. There was no previous knowledge in terms of research on people born without arms. It's so incredibly rare. So there was no database. And remember, this was the early 60s. Mom couldn't even go to the library, let alone the computer, because there was no internet or no computers. So mom kind of just went with it. But you know what? Every day mom learned something. But here was the key. Mom didn't do it for me. Uh -huh. this, should be a, this should be a clue for parents of able-bodied children, right? We <laughs> always want to help our kids. <laughs> we always want them to 
had a stress-free life, have no problems. Well, mom knew that it was going to take me a few times to learn to do, you know, here, here's a good example. I, I, I have to show my coffee cup, and if everybody can read this, it says, the world needs more Canada. I'm a little bit biased to my country. Yeah. But it's an example of if I wanted to hold a cup, Mom would give me a cup like this. I learned how to put it between my toes. The trick was learning how to put it up to my mouth to have a drink. That was how everything evolved. Hey, man, there was no classes. There was no course. There was no study guide. This all came out of lots and lots of failure and lots and lots of success. Wow. So, hold on. Let me... Let me let me just let me just let me just talk to the audience here a bit, guys. I, 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 there is a reason why I want you guys to watch this program here today. There is a reason why, I, I, and I know we're still having the notification issue, so a lot of people probably didn't get a notification for today. So I want you guys to help me. There is a reason why I want you guys to invite 10, 15, 20. Just invite, go down your list and invite people because there's able-bodied people more than able body that always sit there and complain about minor things now we have a gentleman here who is going to tell us and show us and teach us about the things that he could do and have no worries in the world and he has no arms and i want you guys to pay particular attention to this story so this is why this is the reason why i want you guys to watch it this is why i say that this is probably going to be the best ride along for me right because so much that could be learned from this Right. So, 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 Alvin, what about sports? What about <laughs> those other extracurriculum things than just eating and feeding yourself? You know, you know it, it's actually a really good question because I, I know this is a, a modern day thing. We're all supposed to be, you know, uh, label free. We're not supposed to, you know, be worried about gender and all these things. And I agree. But when I was a little boy, I was a little boy. You know, let's be honest, this was the 60s, this was the 70s. It was a little different time. Boys played boy sports, girls played girl sports. I mean, that's wrong, but that's the way it was. So I was a typical little boy that wanted to play every single sport. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I wanted to play baseball. You know, I actually was even on a little league team for one season, but I couldn't actually play. Come on, uh, Alvin, base Alvin, baseball, come on. Come on, Alvin. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just wait. So, so this is my point. I wanted to play baseball so bad that when they had the tryouts in our neighborhood, I just went. My mindset was never, oh, I guess I can't play that because it just didn't work for me. That's not how I thought of things. Honest to God. So when I go to this baseball diamond in our neighborhood to try out for this little league team, you know, when I got there, yeah, kind of a wake up call like, oh, maybe I won't be able to actually play baseball. But here's the funny part of the story. The coach of the team because I was known in town, knew one of my favorite things to do was to run, because I love to run. Right. And I was a really good runner. So because this was a community team, it's not like we were trying to win the World Series, he put me on the team as the official pinch runner. So even though I couldn't play on the field, and even though I couldn't you know, use a bat, when every man we'd be way ahead, usually he'd put me in for one of the other kids, and I'd run. And you know what? I had a uniform. I had my name on the backs. Even though I didn't contribute to winning for the team, I mean, you don't think that way when you're nine, right. I still was part of a team. Uh, football, uh, you know what, that one I kind of figured out there wasn't even going to be a position I could fake. I could be a <laughs> kicker, <laughs> but I'm not that tough. You know, and I know what everybody's thinking at home right now, or on, on, on their devices, you could play the other football, you know, soccer. Soccer. Yeah, exactly. I was really good at soccer. I had the bonus, man. I never got the penalty for touching the ball with my hands. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, but the fact is, in Canada, where I grew up, everybody played hockey, right? Ice hockey. Yes. That's what we played. Everybody played ice hockey. I would play with my friends uh -huh. on the rink, and I would be the goaltender. You see what I mean? A lot of people, not to change stories here, man, but just for one brief moment, a lot of people might be wondering, well, you weren't bullied? No. I mean, did I get made fun of once in a while? Sure. Were there a couple of bad actors in my town? Of course. They're everywhere. The difference was not that my friends stuck up for me. The difference was I learned how to stick up for myself. And that wasn't kicking people. That wasn't fighting people. That was acknowledging I'm a little bit odd. I will get noticed. But here's the point of the segue. I knew certain sports I shouldn't even bother. Right. But yet, having said that, my dad even bought me a pair of skates to see if I could actually learn how to do that. So the first time on a sheet of ice, I tripped over my brand new skates, fell right on my face, gave myself a bloody nose. But my father, instead of picking me up, 
from the ice feeling sorry for me, drying my tears and taking me out for an ice cream cone. He's yelling from the edge of the ice, what are you doing? And I'm answering, bleeding. And he answers back, well, get off your butt. You're making a mess. <laughs> I acknowledge right from the very beginning, not only were my abilities to play sports going to be limited, but my parents' sense of a reality check yeah. was the most important element. They made me understand that, you know what, man, life is hard. And there's certain things you won't be able to do. Accept those things. But then maybe someday something will come down your way that will actually be something you can do. And, of course, I know where we're going with this down the road in this interview. I don't want to get ahead of us. But that's where the missing link came to what really changed my life. Yeah. Now, your parents, and guys, let, let me just say that before we go any further. Guys, this is a conversation. I want you guys very involved as well. Um, Kendall, Vento, say no song. Mm -hmm. Kendall, I think you need to check your device. Uh, I want you guys to be involved with this conversation as even as I am. So if you have any questions, you could post it in to, to, to Alvin. And I'm going to open up the phone line a little bit later so you guys could call in and say hi to Alvin here. So, so uh, Alvin, your parents, did they treat you differently? Like stuff like making up the bed. Um, did they do that for you or, or, or they, 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 they allowed you to, to be you or learn how to do it or do it on your own? Yeah, you know what? I think uh, I want to remind your audience that this sounds like I'm just making this all up. Uh, and I want to acknowledge that this is why I was extremely fortunate. But when people are thinking of my extremely fortunate scenario, I want them to also keep in mind that I had to work very, very hard to become independent. And that was the key to my mother's philosophy. I had to make my bed every day before school. I had to pick up my toys every night before bed. I had to vacuum the carpet in our house with my foot using one of those old school vacuums, right? In fact, as we speak, I live in a beautiful home in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. We've got two stories. It's about 3,000 square feet. Guess who gets to do the vacuuming? <laughs> Me. So that's part of what I learned. And, and even better, I had to mow the lawn with my chest, shovel snow, you know, in Canada with my chest. I had to take out the garbage or the trash in my teeth. And that was nice. I remember the first time my mom said, go do the dishes. Like, what? Your brothers had to do it at your turn. How am I supposed to do that? My mom always had the same answer. How am I supposed to know? You're the one with a lot of arms. You figure it out. So a lot of people thought my parents were harsh, but actually what they were doing was what we need to do more and more as parents. Sorry if this sounds preachy. We can't do everything for our children. We need them to teach them to do it for themselves because that's where resiliency begins. That's where our ability to cope with the hard world begins. And by the way, while we're on the topic, I want your audience to know I acknowledge some people's lives are really legitimately difficult. Yes. I don't want to put a light on that. I don't want to make brush it over and say, oh, you know what, get over it. That's absolutely not my point. My point is, hey, man, we all got something, don't we? We all got something. And when we reevaluate once in a while, you know, maybe we can see that it's maybe not as big a deal as sometimes we, we make it to be. You know, you get caught in rush hour traffic and you're part of the world and everybody's in a bad mood. Well, if you don't want to be in rush hour traffic, move to Montana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, you took what, what, what we say in the Caribbean, you took the, the, the lime and you made lemonade or is something like that they say. Anyway. So you take, a, you take a, a lime or lemon. And a lemon and make lemonade. lemonade. <laughs> Yes, you yeah, take lemons. Because lemons are sour, right? Lemons yes. Are sour. Lots yes. Of people out there are sour. I got a lemonade. I got a lemon in my life. Yeah, you know what? Cut it up and make a lemonade. Yes, and and you prove to everyone that whatever you have, you treat it as a blessing. Some people would sit there and be like, oh, I ain't got no arm. Look at my. I don't have no arm. Everybody has have arms. I don't have no arm. But you made it work for you. No. The yeah, other, and, and, and if you'll allow me, brother, I, I, this is one of my favorite examples, and this is a little bit of a dated story, but it's a quick one. But in 1966, we had a school right across the street from our house in Yorkton, and my mom and dad took me there to sign me up. My mom and dad weren't, quote, unquote, stupid. You know, I can't do those air quotes. <laughs> my mom and dad weren't stupid, but they were sort of thinking to themselves, you know, there's a school right across the street. Our little boy is now six years old. Let's take him across the street and get him going to school. It, it seemed to make an awful lot of sense. I mean, it makes perfect sense in, in modern-day world. But in 1966... They did not know what they were going to be up against. Right. And quite frankly, this is how the story went. They went into the office. They were going to sign these papers to allow me to go to school. And the principal of the school, which he was not a bad guy, he basically said, you know, he can't come here. And my mom looks at him and says, we live across the street. 
And he says, I know, Mrs. Law, we know where you live, but he has to go across town to the school where crippled kids like him go. Uh -huh. And Mom looked at me and went, he's not crippled. And the principal looked at my mom like there was something wrong with her, too. But he simply looked at me and he says, well, look at him. He is crippled. What do you, he's got no arms. What do you call that? Mom's answer, I swear to God, was Alvin. <laughs> wow. Now, did, did the principal laugh? No. See, this is the point. The principal didn't laugh because he didn't see the humor. But he also certainly didn't see the possibilities, right? All he saw was a little boy without arms, and all that could possibly mean for him was a lot of headaches, a lot of obstacles, a lot of changes have to be made to the school. Well, you know what? He was wrong. But what did he know? He'd never seen a handicapped person like me in his entire life. But it was my dad that made him understand that, you know what? We do live across the street. And where would be the logic in sending this little boy all the way across town so he could go to school with the other crippled kids, that was a terrible word, when he could come right here with the kids who are his friends already. And besides, my wife wasn't kidding. He's not crippled. He's just little Alvin. And he already draws with his toes. And he already writes with his toes. And he can read a book with his toes. So why not just let him have the opportunity? You know what, brother? If he fails, that's good. Because he needs to learn that life is not going to just bow down and welcome him. He's got he's to figure out a way to get his own world into his sphere. And that's exactly what I've done. So I've taught people how to treat me, but more than anything, uh, I love this part of it, man, if you allow me to say this, I changed the mindset of every educator and every school in that town for the rest of its history. So it stopped looking at a person with a disability as what's wrong with them and started seeing what they have in common. Yeah, and that is true too because you decide to get into music. Well, not decide, music found you. Yes. Tell us about yes, that was the, that's the missing link that I made a veiled reference to a minute ago, my friend. Yes. So because I'm going to school and because I've decided that I'm probably not going to make the National Hockey League, you know, and, and play professional sports, I decided that I needed to find something else to do. Right. So, you know, I don't believe in, in, in coincidence. I never have. By chance, one night, I'm at a friend's house. Mom and dad are upstairs playing a game of bridge. They love cards. I was sent to the basement to go do something. They happen to have a piano. So like every little kid, you know, what do they do when they find a piano? They just put their hands on it and bang away. Well, I, I put my foot up on it and banged away because I love the sound of a piano. Right. My mom shouted from upstairs, stop making all that noise. So then I tried playing that song we've all heard, Chopsticks. You know, the little that, 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 that. I did that with my toes. Well, before you knew it, my mom was racing down to the basement. You can play the piano? Well, I don't know. I'm just playing Chopsticks. I wouldn't exactly call this a song. Uh -huh. Well, before you know it, my mom's you know, talking to a lady in town about giving me piano lessons. And the lady in town that was the best teacher in town said, look how short his toes are. How's he ever supposed to play a real piano? He'll never play piano. And of course, now you got two women who have two particularly different points of view, but both are very intelligent. Point is, the woman that taught piano didn't see what my mom saw. And that wasn't short toes. What my mom saw was what I told you before, a heart and a soul and a mind. So all I needed to do was play that up, but I couldn't invite myself into the music system. So by chance, happened to take a test at school in fifth grade, regular school, found out I had 96% on a music aptitude test, and before you know it, I was playing in the band. But I'll bet you your audience will never guess, ever, what that instrument was. You, I, want, me to, you want me to see if they can guess what instrument okay. it was? Okay, before, before you even show it, before you even show it, I'm gonna test them. Guys, so what instrument what instrument do you think that alvin had to play let me see if anyone could guess don't don't even show them yet alvin hold on let me I'm see not them don't show them nothing yet guys i want all you to guess now alvin alvin had to play an instrument and imagine that if you play in keyboard you might think well he need he i mean piano he needs his arm to play piano right think about all the other instruments that exist and let me see if anybody could guess um, Nikki said drums. Who else want to guess? Who else want to guess? Let me see. Let me see. Deanne says drums. Let me see. Let me see. Carla says saxophone. Okay, keep it going. Keep it coming. Keep it coming, guys. What instrument? What instrument? What instrument? What instrument? So, um, Winsome says drums. All right. <laughs> let, let, let. <laughs> I mean, let's, let, let, let's, let, let's bring the, um, the 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 the, the, inten the, the, the intensity right now what is it what instrument was it 
you want me to tell you? Show me. Okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell you quickly because I'm not even going to show you. Okay. I do I do happen to have an instrument here. Uh -huh. fact, yeah, you know, it's a pretty cool time to do this. Let me slide back a little bit. I'm in my home office here in Calgary, Canada. But here is a uh, here's a little instrument that I'm kind of familiar with. And uh, a lot of your audience may have already seen this because that's one of the reasons that I got the Goldcast video was they had seen me play the drums on television for a couple of things I've done. But this is an example of one of the instruments that I learned. Okay, here we go. Just like that. But here's the funny thing, man, while your audience is clapping and hopefully not driving off the road. Uh, <laughs> here's the better part of the story, man, if you'll allow me. Yes. That was actually not the first instrument I played. The first instrument that I played was trombone. Trombone. Yeah, and I want you to picture why this story, it's a real quick one, this yeah. story, one I love to tell every time I do a motivational speech. My mom got this call that I got 96% on this test, and it was from a band director in town who ran the entire city band program. So he wasn't in all the schools. Right. But he was calling my mom to get permission to allow me to play in the band. You know, we needed to get that permission even back in 1971 when this story happened. And mom is all excited. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to give you permission, but, you know, did, did you have an instrument in mind? And the band director goes, hey, you know what? Why don't we just let him pick any instrument he wants? And who knows? Maybe it might have been the drums. I don't know. But he, when he found mom, said, well, you know what? That sounds great. But Mr. McClary was his name, Blaine McClary. Um, I'm wondering about this more important question. Have you met him? <laughs> And, of course, Mr. McClary is going, no, I've never met him. I just got this phone number of his mom, and I'm talking to you right now to get your permission. Why? Is that a problem? And mom says, well, kind of an important time to tell you that uh, Alvin, uh, you know, sort of has no arms. And that's exactly how she said it. Uh -huh. Well, you know, 20 seconds later, the band director is apologizing and hangs up. So it didn't look like I was ever going to get in the band. But the difference is, every now and then in my life, and I think they're out there, I mean, I, I don't even know you, man, but I get a funny feeling that you're the kind of person that sees the glass half full, yeah? Absolutely. You know, glass half empty, glass half full kind of guy? Absolutely. I'm a glass half full, half full kind of guy. Absolutely. You bet. Yes. So Blaine McClary was a glass half full kind of guy too. Yeah. And he just happened to be having a conversation in the staff room one day at the school, talking to a bunch of teachers, you know, sitting around having coffee. Even back in those days, they were probably smoking cigarettes in the teacher's lounge, right? And uh, basically saying, yeah, you know what, I heard about this kid with no arms who wants to be in the band, but I have no idea how, well, how we can fix that. Well, one of the other teachers happened to know me from church, right? Just the way it worked. He yeah. said, I know that kid. He does everything with his feet. And you should see how flexible he is. He can even reach up and, and scratch his nose and scratch his forehead and pick his teeth. Well, we don't do that very often. But, <laughs> you know, it's like he can do all these things. Before the day was over, and I wish I could make this stuff up because I'm not that great a writer, uh -huh. these, these stories come into my life. They mounted a trombone on the side of a chair, uh -huh. and I played with my foot like this. And not only did I play trombone, man, but I was actually the number one lead chair trombone player in Canada's National All-Star High School Jazz Band in 1978. I was one of the best trombone players in this entire country and not not the handicapped kind and the reason I say that is because I didn't think of myself ever as having a handicap I thought the people that have the handicap are the ones that have a negative attitude that would not have called back like Blaine McClary and got me into band Wow so a trombone yeah <laughs> Chopper, I see Chopper, Chopper John West is there as well. Make up yourself, Chopper John West. Guys, I'm going to open up the phone line. I want you guys to call in. All right, the number that I want you to call in, the number 718. Dean, put it up right there for me. 718-701-5720. 718-701-5720. Dean, put the number in there for me. And listen, everybody, by now, or you see where we're going with it. Inspirational time. Inspirational time. So I want everybody to press that love button right there for Alvin. I mean, as I tell you, there's a lot of people right now that is stressed and depressed. They probably, as Alvin said, they probably do have a reason to be that way. But Absolutely. After, after it's watching a tough the, time of year in particular. Sorry, Junior, but yeah. this is a really hard time of year for people. Yes. You know, everyone else like us are wandering around with big smiles on our faces. You know, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Hanukkah, whatever we're saying. And we're just all exhilarated and all in a good mood because that's us. 
and all the time we're in the face of all these people that are struggling, they've had a loss, they don't have a family, they don't have any money, they're, they're, they're out of work, they don't have a Christmas tree, they don't, you know, all these things that are symbols of Christmas. And, I, and I, I, I'm telling you, man, my heart, my heart gets sore when I think about the need out there for people. So by far, I don't want this to be an idea at all. All you got to do is just smile and everything will be okay. No. But what I want people to remember, this is very important, there are other people just like you. There are other people that are less fortunate than you. There's other people that are struggling more than you. There's other people that have a tougher time than you. There's always somebody with a worse position than you. So that may be a little bit of help to understanding perspective. But here's the most important thing, my man. Go and help those people. You know, go to a homeless shelter. Volunteer at a, at a pet shelter. Go somewhere where there's people that are in need. That that can make you feel at least as though you aren't the only one in the world that's having a tough time this time of year. Absolutely, absolutely, guys. I see the call. I see the the, the call um, coming in there, but for some reason my, the phone is still trying to figure out itself. So just hold the call for a second until the phone figure out itself. Um, it's it's just kind of initializing for for some reason. Sure. Uh, so hold remember it. that uh, remember that gold cast video you talked about, Junior? Yes. There's a there's if you want to go look at it one more time, there's actually some pictures of me playing the trombone in that video. Yeah, I I actually saw it. Let, let me just show people a little snippet of that gold cast video. I hope I could pull it up. Um, I hope I. Could... And, and by the way, I didn't want to bring that up just to brag about it, but you know that there's some really good visuals in that program too that can literally show the audience what it is that I'm really doing. And you know, while we're waiting for the calls, and, and please, this is not a commercial announcement, but there's a lot of good video on my YouTube channel, which is just Alvin Toes Law, all one word, Alvin Toes Law. I got the nickname Toes by pretty good, honest tradition of being able to use my feet. So my YouTube channel is just Alvin Toes Law, and my email, or pardon me, my website is just alvinlaw.com. And by the way, like I said, I'm not trying to, to make this commercial, but there's a lot of good resources on there that people can show, not only uh, have a look themselves, but to show others that maybe that can help them perk up their spirits, especially this time of year. Let me take a quick look. Let me take a quick look at that piece of the video, guys. This video is called to see Goalcast. Uh, let me just show them a little piece of it, and we'll come back and chat on the other side. What, what happened, happened to you? you? Can you imagine how long ago I got tired of answering that question? But the fact of the matter is, my physical form, my story, is indeed part of the very powerful message that I believe surrounds attitude. I was on a, on a plane going to Vegas a couple of weeks ago, and a lady was sitting beside me on the plane. The plane took off. She seemed to be uncomfortable. That's not uncommon. All she did was look at me and go, one word, thalidomide. Thalidomide was never meant to be given to pregnant women. In fact, it was a sedative, and it was supposed to be so safe, they thought that anybody could take it. Now, the drug was banned in 1963, thank God, because it, by then it only deformed over 20,000 babies. It could have been hundreds of thousands had the drug continued to live on. Now, it's interesting because this is what she went on to say. I didn't take those pills. Something told me to throw them in the garbage, and I am so glad I did because I was blessed with healthy, normal babies. The point is, thalidomide was a terrible, terrible thing. But that's not how I see it in my own personal life. My life started in a very unorthodox fashion. There is no question that being born without arms is not something people would wish for, right? They called us the victims. I disagree. August 23rd, 1985 was the first time in my life I ever considered how my own mother and father must have felt the first time they held me. And then it occurred to me an even more powerful thought. My mom was 55 years old the first time she held me, and my dad was 53, and I was an orphan in New York and Saskatchewan because my birth family were consulted and counseled and advised to simply sign papers and give me up because in 1960, Babies born with severe handicaps had no life. So on the fourth day of my life, I was homeless. Enter my life, the changers. Hilda Law, Jack Law. So Hilda was my primary caregiver. Hilda had an attitude that is very difficult for me to describe. She saw. Yeah, guys, that was a little snippet there. Uh, sorry for the echo. Thank, thanks, Chopper, um, for giving me an update. I heard there was a little um, reverb in that audio there. So what we're going to do, we're gonna, I'm going to link... Uh, that particular goal cast video so you guys could watch the whole entire video 
um, on uh, Alvin Law stories. It's a very inspirational story. I, I, I suggest that again, you share this video with your kids. You sit down and watch it as a family. Anyone that you know that is going through a lot and, and depressed and all that stuff, I, I recommend, I, I highly recommend that they take a look at this particular video. But, but, um, Alvin, are there or were there any points in your life that you feel depressed? Things that bother you? Any 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 crazy thoughts? Two two times that I can absolutely identify with. Uh huh. One of them was the first time was of course when I went through my adolescence. Yeah. That's not uncommon. Adolescence is tough for a lot of people. I was trying to find an identity. You know, there's a beautiful piece in that video when people get a chance to see it where it shows my wife Darlene. And my wife Darlene and I have been married for 25 years now. And I also have a 33-year-old son from my first marriage. And, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Yeah. But I think what, what's important is when I was a teenager, and let's let's be honest about this, man. When you're a teenager, you want to be loved, right? right. But you want to be cool. You want to look hot. You want to you wanna look good, right? You want your clothes to look good. You want your hair, your makeup, your skin to look good. Well, when you don't got no arms, you don't really look good when you're looking in a mirror. You know, that's just the way it was. So that was the first time I got depressed. Uh, that's what music did to help me get out of it. So I, I learned to play the trombone, and then I learned to play the drums, and then I learned to play the piano. I went back to that after the lady who said I'd never play it was wrong. I decided to play on my own. Music became very, very special to me. Uh, the second time in my life that I got depressed was when I found out that I was going to have an unplanned child. And that is now the baby that was uh, born in 1985. By the way, that August 23rd, 1985 reference was the day that my son was born. Mm -hmm. That whole time frame was depressing because I was in a very unhealthy relationship. And by the way, I don't want to make this a Dr. Phil show, but one of the most important things that I can tell your audience without sounding too dark and ominous is that the most important thing that we take for granted in our lives is when we choose our life partner. You know, we raise our, our bar, right? We raise our bar for our work. We raise our bar for sports. We raise our bar for our music. But we lower our bar when it comes to getting into a relationship. And I think that's a real problem of self-confidence. I did the same thing. I, 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 I was with a gal that I should never have been with. She got pregnant. We had a child. That was the second time I was depressed. But I got out of that depression, <laughs> this is going to sound a bit crude, by leaving that marriage. So uh, eventually I would end up actually becoming a single father to that little boy, and that's a whole other story. Uh -huh. and the third time I was depressed that I can remember it specifically was when my mom passed away in 1996. My mom and I were very, very, very close. And when she left, she was 90, 91 years old, man. It's not like she was just a young thing. And, and it was sudden. She died of a heart attack. But I, I, I went into a very dark depression during those days. But that is when I learned the most important thing that I could tell your audience is if you're in a depression, it doesn't help to be alone. Yeah. I, I, my wife got me out. She took me to friends' places. I went did things like gone fishing and went camping and went out on holidays. And before I knew it, my spirit started to pick itself up. And, of course, there's drugs out there. I don't believe in pharmaceuticals. I never have. Uh, what I do believe is that we can find cures within our own spirituality, the power of prayer, but more than anything, the power of friendship with the people that we love. And that's what's always helped me through. And a lot of people right now may be saying, well, I don't have very good friends. I apologize. You know, that's, that's so sad. But that's even more importantly why I said you never know where you can find a new friend at a, at a homeless shelter where other people are volunteering or through your church or through your community. Whatever it takes, man, please don't be alone if you can't this time of year. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what was the most powerful thing? Guys, Chaba, if you have to call back, anyone got to call back the line. The phone lines are back up and running. Uh, so you could call it back. The number seven one eight seven zero one five seven two zero. 718 One of the most powerful things that I saw you spoke about was the label that was placed on your head, right? And I could relate to it in a way in a racial situation. Because a lot of times when people look at, say for instance, a lot of a lot of uh, minority communities, black or Hispanic communities, they feel like they have a label on their head as to when they, they're in a certain environment, they feel like they're targeted or of sorts, right? They feel like they are they are they are being uh, disenfranchised or they feel like they've been taken advantage of or that label. Talk to us about the label that we put 
that 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 we have on our on our head and that that we that we that that we carry with our, with us tell, t- tell us about the labeling you know th- th- this uh, we could talk about this subject junior for five or six shows and you know what I have a funny feeling we may be doing this again yes. I still want to get in your car man and drive so yes. I can be the one that's behind the wheel yeah <laughs> um, but but here's the deal and I, and I want to make this very quick so whenever people think I'm gonna tell a really long story I'm not right but there is a story here and it starts out being kind of funny and then it ends up being not funny, but there's a wonderful ending to it. When I was 15 years old, actually approaching my 15th birthday, I was out having lunch with my dad during a very tough phase in my own self-image segment, right? That teenage adolescent thing. <laughs> and again, this is meant to sound a little comical, but it's really how I do it. I was out having lunch at a burger place. So I had this big old juicy burger, and I put a burger between these two toes here, okay, when I eat. And I got to, you know, you got to kind of fit it in there, so you got to, you know, squish the burger. So... So you get it in your toes, and then and then I eat with my feet. And by the way, when I'm done, you know, I have to lick my toes because it's all part of a, a good meal. I, I apologize if that just made anybody nauseous. But the fact is, I'm eating this burger, and I'm, I'm 14 years old, and I, and I look across the restaurant, and there's a total stranger, and I'm not exaggerating this, going, oh, that is the grossest thing I've ever seen in my And he was just going on, right? And I, uh, I saw him. My dad, however, had his back turned to him so he couldn't see and I'm kind of watching this guy and I very very quickly got my own nauseous I I put my burger down I told my dad that I I was sick I needed to go home when we got home my dad knew something was wrong so eventually he came into my room and sat down with me my dad was always really good at this and said you know what's bugging you and I was just in a foul mood and I basically said I'm sick of being me you know, I'm sick of my life. I'm sick of being stared at. I'm sick of being made fun of. I'm sick of people laughing at me. I'm sick of people making jokes about me. And I'm totally sick of everybody when I go to a restaurant practically throwing up when I eat a burger with my foot. Now, you can even notice the anger just in me telling the story, right? Imagine how angry I was that day at the inequity in life, right? And, and But people out in the audience get this exactly. There is inequity in our world. Yes. But here's the end of the story. My dad looked at me and he said, okay, son, I'll tell you what. We've got a couple of options here. Option A, if you don't want to get stared at, laughed at, looked at, commented on, or made fun of forever, then you know what? Never leave the house, son. Just go in the basement, you know, stay down there. There's a bathroom down there. Your mother can throw toast down to you every couple of days till you don't starve. And you don't have to go to school anymore. You hate school anyway. And you don't have to go out in the community anymore. You can't stand those people. Just stay home for the rest of your life and your problem will go away. So I looked at my dad and I went, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And here's the key line, Junior. My dad said, you're right. It is stupid. The world is full of stupid people. So if you want to put a label on anything, take the label off your head and put it on theirs. So when you're looking at somebody treating you improperly, treating you with a race problem or a prejudice problem, I don't know if this works for your audience or not, but just kind of filter through your eyes and look at them and say, oh, yeah, that's that label on their forehead. Stupid. Ignorant racist, whatever word you want to use, because at the end of the day, sadly, there are people like that in our world. But I refuse to believe or acknowledge, brother, that they are the majority. It just feels like it sometimes. I know so many people that acknowledge me, that hug me, that love me, based exactly on who I am. I know black people, I know Mexican people, I know yellow Chinese people, I know every kind of brand on planet Earth, but I just don't see the color, my friend. I see the human, and if that sounds perfect, it is what it is. So it's a matter of changing the label. Yeah, and you know what? Change the way you see your own label. You know, if you're a proud African American, good for you. But are you really just an African American? You know, I can look at you, man, and I see the black skin, and I see the dreads, and I think, I'm guessing he's from the Caribbean somewhere. There's something about your swagger. Am I right about that? Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I mean. Be proud of your heritage. That's not what I'm saying. Don't take that away. But don't expect other people to always like you for who you are because that's the ignorance that's out there. The label that we have to put in our own mind is the label of human being. Human being. That's the one thing our entire planet has in common. And i got to tell you, that's what worries me a little bit is we're so fractured in our cultures. You know, the people in the Middle East are thinking this. The people in Russia are thinking that. The people in China are thinking that. The people in India are thinking that. But what about the idea that we're all alike inside our skin? Because we all bleed the same color, we all cry the same tears, and we all have the same passion for life, 
if you can figure out how to get there because we only get one. Yeah. I mean, I think that you are so uniquely qualified to speak on stigmatization. I think that you're uniquely qualified to speak and understand the difference of how races are treated because when people look at you and they see you as a disabled man, but inside you're not a disabled man. Similarly, when some people look at a black man and they think that, yeah, all they see is a black man, but really and truly he's more than a black man. So you might be uniquely qualified to even speak on race. That's why I said by speaking with you and by developing this little friendship here, I, I, I see that, you know, we could we could do so much work. We could do so much, so much together as small and insignificant that people might think it might be. But I think a lot so much more could be done in bridging that gap, because when you walk down the street here, like just today, let me tell you a quick story. Yeah, yeah. I was I was in the city today, Manhattan. And I'm driving and I pulled over and and this police officer, white police officer, uh, came over. Apparently I was just I just stopped. I just pulled over and I, I I stopped there for a second. Without coming and asking me any question as to move the car, or whatever. He just came and he scanned my registration and gave me a ticket. Right? A hundred and fifteen dollar ticket, right here. A hundred and fifteen dollar ticket, right? And I'm like, yo. He could have just asked me to move, right? But he didn't see the decency and the, he didn't, he didn't, he couldn't feel the, you know, just the humane part of himself. Dante just said, just move up a little bit, brother. Dante just watch me and scan me and give me a $150 ticket. Yeah, see, that's why when I, I think you and I were talking about this off the air. And that was when we talked about this idea of this incredible race problem, especially between cops and, and black people in the United States. That is an absolute truth, and it's an absolutely disgusting thing. And, but you know what I also think is a bit off the, off the topic here, a little bit of our subject and, and discussion today, is let's keep in mind, and by the way, I am not at all defending that cop. Uh, most cops tend to be white. I wonder why that is. It's a question we need to ask, not that all white cops are racist. We need to ask why there's so many white cops. Secondly, we also need to examine the consciousness of police officers, period. You know what? We, we tend not to get warm and fuzzy people signing up for police college. And this is not to disparage police. You know, what happened on 9-11 in New York, that's a whole other story. And those were white and black and all kinds of brown cops going into those towers. I think we need to acknowledge that not every cop who's white is a bad cop. True. Not every black man who carries a piece inside their jacket is a criminal. Not right. every uh, you know Chinese person that drives a, a low riding Lexus is is a, is a gangster member. You know we we've got these stereotypes, and that's that label that I was talking about, and they exist. I get that, but the idea of the gold cast video and change the label is not to change the entire label that we put on people in the world. It's change how we see ourselves. You know what? And I got to tell you. That, that, that story you just told, that's a perfect example of why we get angry and why we get frustrated and why we start to blame race. Who the hell knows, man, about why he did that? But here's the answer to your question, Junior. You know, pay the ticket. Let it go. You know what? You're going to meet dickheads everywhere you go. True. But you don't have to live with them. True, 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 true. So inspirational. I mean, listen, from a man who has no arms that don't sit there and stress and worry about everything. You found a way to make your toes work for you. Alvin, let me tell you, I could never, I, I tried to think about lifting my feet to touch my, <laughs> let me, let me, I, I would, uh, Alvin, I can't even lift my feet to touch my stomach. <laughs> and and it, for you, it's like, it's natural. You know, you took what you have and you made it work. You have, it's like you have $5 and you made it into a million dollars. It's like you have lemonade, lemon and you made lemonade. You did not stress about the $5 that you have, or you didn't stress about the sour lemon that you have. You made the sweet lemonade and that is what is important. So people could translate that into their own lives. Whatever you have right now is a blessing for you. Whatever you're going through is a blessing for you. It is your life. It is your challenges. It is your it, it, it is your experience. You have to take whatever you have. Two dollars, make it work for you. Anything you have, make it work for you. Alvin, I think 
As I said, you're uniquely qualified to talk about all them things on them here, you know. But I'm going to give you another opportunity, Ave. I know you do a lot of motivational speaking. I want you to talk to our audience and uplift the spirit of people that are watching again. Preach to them. Talk to them, Alvin. And let them, let, let's leave on a very positive, inspirational note. So here, here's my one piece of advice, not just Christmas season advice or New Year's advice, but life advice forever. A lot of human beings, and I will say this with great affection, especially in the United States, believe they have a right. They have a right to an education. They have a right to housing. They have a right to a job. They have a right to happiness. I totally get that. But what happens when you're born without arms is your mind says something different. Your mind says it's a privilege to go to school. Your mind says it's a privilege to have a place to live. Your mind says it's a privilege to have a place to go to work. It says you're a privilege to have a house over your, or a roof over your head. It's a privilege to be alive. I know that sounds incredibly preachy, but that's exactly what is the foundation of my belief system. You know, that school story about my parents getting me into a public school. Every morning before school, my mom would send me out the door going, remember, Alvin, you're one of the only disabled students to ever go to public school in this town. Don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. It was a, it was a rhyme in my head that at many times I got sick and tired of, but at the end of the day, it really does work. Again, I know there's lots of challenges out there. I know we got lots to complain about, and we got you know all kinds of stuff happening. And with due respect, especially in, in the United States, where the country seems to be so divided by politics, you know what? Here's a piece of advice. When you get up tomorrow morning, don't turn on the news. Don't look it up on your device. Don't turn on CNN or Fox. Go to the comedy channel. Listen to a stand-up comedian. Go to the music channel. Find some inspirational music that makes you want to sing. Go to something that uplifts you. Even if it's on the internet, look at it. Kittens. We don't need more bad news because there's enough to go around. We need to be reminded that there's good news all around us. And if we can contribute to that good news in our lives, then it all comes back to us. Everything we give comes back to us. We give out anger, we get more anger. We give out hate, we get more hate. We give out all these negative emotions, we just get them back in our face sometimes 10 times as strong. But I guarantee you from this interview, if you have been paying attention, if you give out a positive energy, if you got a loving energy, if you give out a caring energy, and if you got an energy that we can work this out, we can make this better, we can make not only America great again, but we can make the world exactly that too that we live in a wonderful place brother we're so blessed to be alive even though sometimes it doesn't feel like it we just gotta figure out a way to see from a different lens the same view that everybody else has thank you thank you thank you alvin if if people's eyes are not open up today um i'm not sure what will make their eye open up alvin you're my brother we're gonna keep in touch we, look, we need to do a, a take two, a uh, round two, maybe Absolute, in the new year. Absolutely, absolutely, anytime. You are now a member of what we call the Ride Along Support Group. And as, uh, as a true member of the Ride Along Support Group, Alvin, we're going to be reaching out to you from time to time to get strength. Cause anytime. Even, and if even, I may do this in the camera, Yes. here's one to you, and brother. Fist bump. Fist bump. <laughs> Fist bump. <laughs> Hold on, hold on, hold on, Alvin. We gotta leave. We gotta leave with with some drums. Everybody wants some drums to end it off. All right, I'll bring the drum right back here, and this is one of my favorite things to play. And by the way, while we're on the topic, this is one of my favorite things. These drumsticks were given to me by Neil Pert, who plays drums with the rock band Rush. So I gotta tell you, I've inspired a lot of people in a lot of places, and Neil Pert's one of the great ones. He gave me these sticks. So let's play along a little bit, Neil Pert drumstick music. There you go. That's the beat, bro. All right. Alvin on the drums. <laughs> Thank you, Alvin. We're definitely going to keep in touch, guys. And also, we're going to put a link to Alvin. So if you guys want to say hi to Alvin, uh, we'll put a link in the program there as well. Alvin, we'll keep in touch. Big up, big up, big up, big up. Thanks, brother. Thanks. Merry Christmas, man. Love you. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Now tell me, now tell me, tell me 
Oli didn't like that. I feel even yeah, I feel even better after than than than, than the beginning. Yeah man, trust me, I feel the vibe. Trust me. Listen, if all you if all you go into anything right now, like when you started the program, you had all this weight, heavy weight on your shoulder. I want all you to just shake it off. Shake off all the negativity, all the stress, all the headache, all the all the anything negative going on in your life right now. We go shake it off like this. 